Requests of the Broadcasting and Recording Services, members and visitors in the public gallery are requested to ensure that for the duration of the meeting, their mobile phones are turned off completely or switched to airplane safe or flight mode, depending on their device. It's not sufficient, just put your phones on silent, as this will maintain a level of interference with the broadcasting system. Item number six today on the agenda is on board Planola, so I would like to welcome to today's meeting Mr. Dave Walsh and Ms. Loretta Lampkin and Ms. Rachel Kenny from on board Planola. And before we begin, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 172I of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege and respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege and respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or unofficially either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Can I just, first of all, on behalf of the committee, wish you well in your new role, Dave. I know you're, you're there three months now, um, but I think you bring vast experience. And I'd, I personally would like to wish you well in this endeavour. You're hugely missed on the other side, but I know that you bring vast experience and expertise to this area, so I'd just like to wish you well in, in that role. But uh, I'd now like to call on you for your opening statement. Thanks very much. And, 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 and committee members, thank you for the opportunity uh, to appear before the committee um, so early enough in my, in my term to discuss some of the important work that the board is doing and also to highlight some recent progress and priorities for the coming year. And as you mentioned, I'm joined by Ms. Loretta Lampkin, the Chief Officer, and Rachel Kenny, Director of Planning. Um, and with your indulgence, as I've only recently taken up the post, where there are some questions that they may be more kind of a better place to answer, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to defer to those uh, kind of uh, to my colleagues here. So the board, I think, is well aware of its critical role in considering and determining planning appeals and major housing and infrastructure proposals and we remain fully committed to delivering decisions as quickly and effectively as possible. The national planning framework and the emerging regional spatial and economic strategies set a clear priority for appropriate development in the right locations to facilitate the sustainable and orderly growth of our cities, towns and rural hinterlands and the board has a clear role in implementing such policies through efficient processing of case decisions. In a constantly evolving and more complex legislative and legal context, where environmental issues and public participation are to the fore, it is also crucial that the board has all the information it needs to make sound decisions and gives people time to feed in their views and proposals during the deliberative process. This reflects our core principles of integrity, independence and fair-mindedness. To give you a little background on the organisation, the board currently has 159 and a half whole-time equivalent staff as well as 10 board members. The Minister and the Department has been very supportive in approving recent resource requests in recognition of the increased demands and complexity of the cases that are coming before the board, including in relation to strategic housing de developments, vacant site levy cases and major infrastructure projects, as well as the forecast increase in case intake that we expect over the coming years. We are currently undertaking a workforce plan to assess our future capacity to deliver on the statutory mandate in a timely manner and we will shortly be writing to the Minister identifying what we see as the core resource requirements to maintain and improve our performance. While it is acknowledged that the Board's capacity and performance to meet our statutory objective period of 18 weeks has been impacted by the transition to our new IT system called Planet, the increased intake uh, and caseload as well as the fallout from reduced Board capacity in the past, we have made strong progress to turn things around in recent months. In 2018, we recorded a 32% increase in the number of cases decided over the previous year, with over 2,800 decisions made. And in November and December alone, we decided almost 600 cases, which was up 36% on the same oh, months in 2017, uh, which helped to reduce the number of cases on hand by more than 300, from the, uh, the level of 1,355 to just over 1,000 files currently. And I think this, this great push and effort reflects the commitment of our hardworking staff and board to really get to grips with the backlog generated and deliver robust decisions as efficiently as possible. In terms of meeting our 18-week statutory objective period for deciding normal planning appeals, we are aware that a 40% rate is not where we want to be. But equally, the priority and focus for me 
in my first few months has been to process and decide cases longest with the board, which has meant that many of the cases determined in the last three months are already beyond the 18 kind of week period. This has had a knock-on consequential impact on our percentage compliance rate, but we have a clear plan in 2019 to clear the backlog during the first half of the year and get back to a compliance rate of 80% plus by the end of the year. And already in, in the month of December, the compliance rate for appeals decided in the month had improved to almost 50%. The board's performance in relation to strategic housing developments has been very strong, with 39 cases deciding during 2018, all well within the 16-week target. In overall terms, the board granted planning for over 7,100 housing units and almost 4,500 student bed spaces during 2018, which is a vital contribution to the overall increase in residential activity. We expect a significant increase in housing applications in 2019, reflecting the ongoing demand for pre-application meetings, and we have 19 applications up for decision in the next three months, which will have an aggregate capacity to deliver approximately 4,170 residential units and over 1,750 student bed spaces. We will continue to prioritise these cases and also deal with any large-scale housing appeals expeditiously. Over the course of 2018, Onboard Panola prepared a five-year strategic plan with four clear goals to, firstly, protect and enhance our reputation for independence, impartiality, integrity, trust and transparency. Second, make robust, timely and high-quality decisions which support proper planning and sustainable development. Thirdly, improve our service to meeting change customer expectations. And lastly, to foster a motivated, resilient and responsive organisation. While this is, of course, a five-year strategy, there are a number of initiatives and actions which we'll be prioritising in 2019 to help to realise these objectives and set us on the right path. High among these priorities is the rollout and refinement of our Planet project, which will ultimately enable applications and appeals to be made online, linking in with the local authority's own e-planning initiative. 2019 will also see the development of a new website to make it easier to find information and a separate web portal through which online appeals and applications will ultimately be lodged. Furthermore, in light of the likely increase in strategic infrastructure applications, I am also prioritising a review of our processes, including our pre-application consultations, to learn and apply lessons from our own and participants' experiences in the past, and to identify ways to streamline and ensure that we are operating as efficiently as possible to facilitate robust and swift decisions. As the largest planning body in the country, with exposure to a wide range of case types and issues, I believe it's also incumbent on the board to support the department, planning authorities and the new office of the planning regulator to ensure that planning policies are practical, consistent and clearly understood by all. The board provided practical, helpful advice to the department in relation to the establishment of the strategic housing development functions in 2016 and I believe we can also contribute to shaping and informing new policies and legislation to improve everyone's understanding of the planning code and ensure a consistency of approach across the country. I'm conscious I'm taking up members' valuable time to raise particular issues, so I might leave it there, and we're happy to take any questions. And just to say, I have included um, a couple of, of graph summary graphs behind my statement that give you a sense of the, the types of cases we deal with and also the, the level of activity over the, over the recent years. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Victor? Well, firstly, I'd like to thank Dave and wish him well and his staff for coming here today. And, and I suppose also to acknowledge, I've read, I want to thank you for your presentation, which was circulated to us yesterday, and I read in detail. So I'm just going to prep a few questions with a few comments, really, and maybe you might just take them as you see fit. And I suppose I first want to acknowledge that the Onboard Plan is independent. Its, it's independence is important. Its impartiality is important. Its participative encouragement and engagement and transparency is also important in the process but it's a two-way process and I think if I was honest and fair to say I think some people uh, in the public domain feel that sometimes the board isn't impartial and the board doesn't help itself of course when it gives a very sort of summarized version how you report your activities and you particularly report your findings raises some concerns but look there's always going to be a certain amount of tension in, in a system and I suppose I'll just go through the issues that I, as I, I see them because we're conscious that it's about planning, it's about sustainability, it's about be, making better communities, and there's always going to be tensions there. So the issues I want to raise firstly, you have a statutory 18-week process for decision-making. It's been poor in the past, and I took the time to look at your predecessor's last three reports 
your annual reports today and I had a look at them and they constantly talk about striving to increase the statutory obligation of the 18 weeks. So clearly you've addressed that and you're going to work on that but it is something that is of major concern. We hear big developers talking about their frustrations with the process but I, I'm not, I'm, I, but as someone building an extension or a cottage in the west I still think we need to comply with the key statutory objective of 18 weeks and I'd like to hear that. You might detail the, your exchequer income that the board receives, your sources of funding, that's your principal one and, I, and, and uh, I'm aware of what you got in 2018. You might just tell me what's budget in terms of exchequer funding for a board plan for 2019 if you have it to hand, if you haven't you might come back to us on it. Your predecessor talked about an independent review in 2016, was decided to have it, it sort of under, started in 2017. There was a substantial amount of recommendations, I looked at those, some of them have never been implemented, there may be good reason why, some of them have been implemented on a stage basis, and like for instance one of them I'm thinking about under that key review was how the board itself is appointed, and you're going to look at that, and you might just tell us how that's progressing. Uh, and maybe if you don't have it today, you might furnish, look, an update on the review, if you think that's appropriate, if you think that's right, you might talk to us about that. In terms of resources, is the board equipped to successfully meet the challenges that are increasing in, in terms of your remit, your expanded remit, your expanded competence and your demands by, by government effectively on you, and also particularly mindful of rebuilding Ireland and your commitments, and again, the board has not delivered on all its targeted commitments in relation to rebuilding Ireland. And it's simple, if you, do a if you do a word search on rebuilding Ireland in the five pillars, you will see all the commitments there. And can I suggest at some stage, it might be helpful for this committee, that if we actually look back uh, at all the key objectives that the board were tasked with, uh, and there may be good reason why they're not happening. You mentioned I planning, plan it is another one. Uh, again, that's, mystery of all guidelines, but I know you were doing a pilot scheme, etc. But I think it might be a good exercise to look back at, in relation to the board and its ta what issues it was tasked with as part of rebuilding Ireland. Your information and communication technology strategy, how we're going to engage more with the public in relation to this, how do we have a situation, you know, in terms of platforms and engagement, because it is important where we have big planning applications, particularly outside of Dublin. People don't have the same benefits to, you know, you know to get in. They, particularly the board, and I, I will leave it at that. I think you know what I'm talking about. In terms of sort of litigious issues, and this is becoming a real big issue, and it's been identified by your predecessor as well. We, you may have seen prime time last night, and I want to put on the record of this committee, there's been a lot of public negative comment about government cabinet ministers, TDs, county councillors, and various other representative bodies in terms of their interface with the planning process. And I want to clearly say I have absolutely no difficulty. I do not believe we should be apologising as public representatives about engaging in the planning process. It is a representative role. It is right and proper and appropriate that public representatives make representations on behalf of their constituents. The difference is there has to be open and there has to be transparent and there has to be a mechanism for a public to see those interfaces with the planning authority. But I think that's worth saying because, again, it came up last night. Again, I saw the, the Sunday Independent carried a massive story that implied that politicians were all over the place frustrating planning processes. If the system is robust enough, if it's correct, if it's full of integrity, it will withstand uh, challenges. That's all they are, challenges. And then, so I want, to, I want to draw your attention to three or four more things. I'm not going to comment, but I'm going to draw your attention to a, a very interesting case, which is Conley versus on board Planola. This is, uh, not a live no, no, this is not a live case. You'll be delighted to know it's been complete. Uh, there was a planning case in relation to it. Uh, it was, your decision was overturned. It, it was appealed to the High Court. I'm not going to go into any more detail. Uh, it was the the case the board lost. The board then went on to the Supreme Court. You also lost there. And I think it's really interesting. I have the judgment here. So a lot of money was incurred by you, by your organization, but that's your prerogative and I respect that. But I just want to say, we should be very careful. We have a situation now where we effectively have no appeal system for anything over 100 houses. So unfortunately, because of the government's arrangements and rebuilding Ireland and the priorities of the Customs House, we effectively have the first put is to the board in major planning applications. There's no appeal. We now have a situation where we're going from a board law to the court. So the courts are now becoming nearly the arbit arbitrators in relation to planning. And it's of concern. 
It has to be of concern to you, it has to be of concern to the public, it has to be of concern to us, because there's huge costs, huge exposure for you, and it's not a nice place for anyone to find themselves in, and particularly it's not a nice place when there's a lot, a lot of money. But I just, anyone to reference that, I'm happy to send it on, but I think there are some lessons to be learned in that particular case, and of course, the vast cost against you. And then just wrapping up, you might talk about the conflict of contravening local county development plans. This is, comes with great annoyance to local councillors. They have county development plans. It's one of the, the biggest powers and functions they have. And then you as a board decide. And what's further frustrating is that the board decides to make a determination on a planning application. Your inspector decides to, that it's, it shouldn't go ahead. And then the board overturned our inspector. That's very frustrating for people. We, the board, and I understand the board have a role. I understand the role of the inspector, but I'm saying you need to communicate those concerns on that. Uh, and then, as talked about rebuilding Ireland, I think that's important. Uh, I won't talk to you, but I want to illustrate something. And again, it's not a live <coughs> application. It's the Dunleary Cruise Bart. I don't want to go into it. I just want to say, when I looked at your website this morning, I was no greater aware of what was happening. There's no clarity about where that is. So I think a lot of it's about mes messaging. And as I say, I'll wrap up, by, and I know there's a lot in all of that, but I'm supportive. I recognise the independence of the board, but I think it is about communicating messages. And I'm particularly interested in, again, how you appoint the members and other, current, other currently vacancies on your board. Thanks so much, Senator, and I uh, appreciate the, uh, the comments and, and the support. Um, what I might do is I'll try and deal with yep. most of those issues, and uh, Loretta and, and, and Rachel might, might step in on and kind of, uh, and elements of them. Um, I suppose on the question of communication, and, and I suppose coming into the organisation, um, and I have to admit I'm, I'm very impressed with the calibre of people, both on the board and indeed throughout the organisation, but I think when you come in with a, a fresh perspective, it's always good to to test and review what's, what's there and to see how, kind of, uh, as a chair, you can add value and how you can further improve. And I think communication is something that is hugely important, uh, both in terms, internally within the organisation and within the system from local to national government, but also in communicating to, to stakeholders, to members of the public. And I think certainly the context of the system that we operate at the moment in terms of how we make information available, how we justify and actually explain the rationale for our decisions. Mm. I think there are things that kind of, uh, we are constantly kind of evolving and improving. I think we can always make it kind of clear. I think use of plain or English kind of where we can. Obviously, we still work in a very complex legislative and legal context, so there are some legalese that we have to reflect in our decisions, but equally in terms of making that information available and accessible on, a, on, a, on a, an improved website is something that we are working through. I did mention, uh, and you raised the issue of the strategic objective period and the 18 weeks, yeah. um, you know, and we have made progress even in those few months, and I think over the next six months, the reason why we're still actually, I think, at 40 or, or in the low 40s um, is actually because we have taken a conscious decision to actually deal with the oldest cases and make sure that people aren't waiting for any longer, whether it's for large-scale applications, whether it's for an extension to their house, or whatever it might be, and, and certainly the efforts of the board have been, uh, and throughout the organisation, has been to prioritise those. We are working through, and a lot of the older cases are now being dealt with and, and have been addressed. So I think over the course of the next three or six months, you will see kind of that percentage coming back to where it needs to be. There will always be cases that require further information, that may require oral hearings. So I think it is a challenge to say that every single case will be met within the 18 weeks, but certainly we expect to be back to where we, we were in the last three or four years where we were hitting 80%, 85%. And that's something that, that, that's certainly a target that we're setting ourselves uh, for, for the end of 2019. Um, but I recognize that you know, people need to actually also understand and, and have communicated those kind of dates and ensure that there is transparency as to when they expect a decision if it isn't uh, meeting the 18 week target. Um, we actually haven't got exchequer kind of income kind of in our, in our budgets for 2019 just yet, so, but I'm happy to communicate that when we do get it. I would hope that kind of certainly uh, we have communicated to the department what is, is kind of we feel is required in terms of both our capital and current spend, and you know, we continue to engage and, and, and communicate with them. And I would, Sorry, I would just, to, just this 219, we're in 219 now. 219, so we have actually kind of, we have to wait for confirmation of our, of our budget line, but in terms of how it's, how it's spread out, but we've actually set our case out and, um, 
you know, we actually kind of continue to, I suppose, have, have sufficient kind of comfort that what we're doing kind of will, will have the resources and, and, and we will kind of have both existing and if, if we do require kind of further resourcing under the workforce plan that we're undertaking, I think we'll certainly kind of be pushing an open door from the Minister and the Department. In relation to the independent review, and obviously I was involved in that from the other side kind of uh, back in, in 2015 and 16, um, there has been a huge amount of work done and, and as the, the Minister and the Department would have pointed out, we created a, an implementation group comprising both department officials and indeed the board officials to, to look at the hundred odd recommendations that were listed, to look at which ones were, uh, were practical that could be implemented and as you say some of them are already in place, others require legislative solutions and obviously the responsibility uh, lies sometimes with the board, sometimes with the department. Um, it's important to note that our five year strategy looked very closely at all of the actions that were within the control of the board and actually we have integrated all of those actions into what we see as our five-year priority strategies. So from the board's perspective, we're confident that there's a very strong correlation between the actions and commitments that we feel we can deliver. And obviously kind of, it'll be a matter for the department uh, and the minister to decide some of those kind of legislative changes or indeed policy changes, including the issue of how the board is actually appointed. And, and that is a set down in legislation, the Planning Act at the moment. So if the minister, it's in the minister's gift to, to look again and see where kind of nominations come from, what bodies are, are nominating bodies, and to determine whether kind of that needs to be updated or, or refined further. But again, the board stands ready to, to support and, and inform and assist the department and the minister in, in, in looking at how best to make that a more efficient and, and responsive process. Um, in relation to, I suppose, the actions we have delivered on, re, on Rebuilding Ireland, I suppose the core element of that has been the strategic housing development um, and certainly I would be you know it's comforting for me to see a policy that I, I, I helped to, to design actually working so well in practice and I think it reflects the work that Rachel and her team and indeed the board itself have done to actually kind of ensure that it was a practical kind of a step it may not be the perfect kind of a solution in terms of everybody's kind of um, you know, getting what they, what they want, but it responded to a particularly acute need where we needed to ensure that there was some clarity and certainty around the timeframes for delivering large-scale housing. And I think certainly in terms of the, uh, the record of, of homes that have been approved, and indeed it's not all kind of, um, it hasn't been a blanket approval. Like we have, we have we've refused about a quarter of applications that, that have come to the board. We have made very clear in our pre-application consultations that there's a lot of work that developers need to do and indeed local authority need to feed in their views. Um, but I think certainly for the, for the next couple of years um, until obviously that has a time stop. So in 2021, that legislation, unless the minister changes it, that is due to actually fall and, and the, pr the process will revert to, to the normal kind of a local authority planning system. Um, I might ask um, Loretta in a moment just to talk about the ICT strategy and the fact that we have actually gone live internally and revamped our entire systems and that and I know that it always takes longer than we might anticipate or might hope for but I think it's important that the board has a fully robust system that it has confidence can actually deliver the job before we go live and allow for kind of uh, online applications themselves um, and I might actually ask Rachel just to deal with the issue of I suppose the national versus local policies and how how the board actually handles the the potential sometimes it might be a mismatch or certainly considerations and how to balance the national versus the local interest in, in certain plans. Um, and I think the last point maybe just to, to address the issue of, of litigation and, you know, there are obviously kind of a lot of kind of costs. We, we spend almost three million on legal costs kind of um, in, in 2018. Um, and, you know, there are cases that we certainly kind of, uh, we look and we say, are there things that we can learn and adapt our systems and make sure that if there are kind of uh, if there are cases or if there are issues that we can address to avoid future litigation we're certainly kind of very much learning from solutions across the board we, we delivered about 2,900 cases uh, dec decided last year 41 cases uh, were, were JORed so there are obviously a lot of high profile cases but in terms of proportion it's not a kind of a, 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 a very significant number but I think anything that that kind of I suppose draws high costs of, of courts and actually kind of takes time to run through the system they're kind of uh, we're certainly looking at kind of uh, ensuring that the state and any public money is, is spent wisely we have a conceded cases where we felt 
that we were clearly kind of deficient in terms of maybe our decision or in terms of the case and, and some of those have come back in and we've had to kind of review them again uh, de novo but I think the point of we have a very strong system where there is opportunities for judicial review where people can take that kind of case and it's important that I suppose the system is efficient uh, and I know that the courts themselves are looking at how to ensure that there is a fast tracking of some of the, the through the commercial courts of some of the kind of uh, what they might see as being critical cases. So some cases, they, they go on the weekly list to, to examine whether they need to be fast-tracked rather than going through the, the longer high court. But I might ask Loretta maybe just to talk a little bit about Planet, and then Rachel might come through. Thanks. Okay, uh, Planet is our, the name of our ICT strategy, so, and I think I, I've spoken to the committee before about the particular project. Um, it's a multi-year project, so we started in 2014. Um, it's done in a number of phases, so we're through phase one and two, so the phase one and two are implementing a new case management system for the organization and a GIS, a geographic information system. So you know, that required a complete overhaul of processes and systems in the organization. So um, we're through that. We launched the system live in October 2017. So every new case that came into the building went onto that system. So now at this stage, we have the bulk, uh, the large majority of all cases on that system. So what happens next is the online services are, will be built on top of that case management system. But as with any uh, of these type of projects, they often take longer than we expect. Um, we're just completing the final phases of a procurement for program management services so that we can start work um, during 2019 on the online, so it's the website and the portal. So and I suppose these are the important parts now for our customers in terms of being able to submit appeals and applications online to be able to make payments electronically to us. So uh, we're just scoping that out and we'd hope to have uh, to be well on our way to progressing delivery of that before the end of the year. Just in terms of um, the query in relation to the contravening of the development plan and the national picture versus the local picture, obviously when the board look at um, both applications in, in the first instance and appeals, we look to the most up-to-date um, policy context and best practice and at the moment that is largely within the national framework given the number of um, recent guidance and policy context changes that have occurred nationally and ultimately all of these will begin to be reflected in the, the county and local the county and local plans over the coming years so there would be less of a mismatch between the national picture and the local policy context if however at the moment we have uh, applications or appeals in with us and there are differences between the two what we do is it, it isn't a, a de facto one way or the other we look at what's the what's I suppose most in accordance with the proper planning and sustainable development and if we are contravening the plan or recommending contravention of the plan it's very clearly stipulated as to the the why we would be doing so and it usually relates to um, a conflict between the local and national picture or even conflicts within particular plans and there are a number of conflicts obviously within particular development plans and local plans so we would look at that in relation to strategic housing obviously uh, we don't have to go through the section 37 um, criteria in order to contravene a plan that the only thing we can't contravene is the zoning objective but that said even for those if a developer is proposing to contravene the plan or materially contravene the plan they're required to advertise that fact when making the application to us and to stipulate or justify why they are actually contravening it and we will look very very clearly at that it isn't a de facto yeah contravene the plan away it has to accord with the proper planning and sustainable development and that's what we look at in order to try and deliver the best for the future thank you. again i want to wish you well um, david in, in your new role and uh, my questions are very similar and um, time scale has has been a massive issue um, and we spoke about the 18 weeks, but I would know in certain areas, in my own area, nearly a year we have had, we have been waiting for a decision, nearly a year. And I think it's unacceptable in the sense of that we have now come to a situation where we have been in a housing crisis, and yet I know whether it's once off or whether it's actually a, a full housing scheme, they have been waiting that length. And I think, you know, in fairness, I know that you're new to the job, but I do feel it's, it's unacceptable. And I know that you are going to change it, but is it staffing issues? I mean, is it the planning application itself? How can something take so long? But also another area that I would feel that, I, and I know that you have to be looking for further information and you're always looking for environmental studies. And I understand you have to do that too, because everything has to be right. But I just feel that there needs to be more um, effort put into timescale. 
and I think it is important now that going forward that this would be the area that you would concentrate on more. And I just wanted to ask this. Um, I understand that we are in the process of clarifying objections to planning. I heard the Minister speak about how legitimate claims could be taken on board with someone in a nice neighbourhood with lots of land around them simply objecting because they did not want more houses built, could, non could no longer object, object on these grounds. Is it really the case that there are a large amount of not-in-my-backyard kind of complaints without merit, enough that the Minister feels he has to legislate for it? Obviously, we want to see houses built for those who need them, but we also um, need to make sure that there is a system in place that everybody is listened to. And maybe you could clarify, because the Minister actually spoke about this there recently, and I was a little bit taken back, so maybe you could explain that to me. The other area is um, that uh, uh, Senator Boyne spoke about is local area plans, and, and particularly in local authorities. And I know at the moment there is a recruitment on for planners um, around the country because it is an issue and, and it has become a, a massive issue. Again, local authorities, the, the zoning is so important. And I have seen in my own area where, when I was a councillor when we would have changed the zoning. And I feel it's an area that we need to work on more quickly because, again, when you change the zoning, and particularly if, if it's for a, a group scheme of housing, it can take so long to get that sorted between going to all the different areas. So I'm just wondering, is there any system in place that we could look at all the different agencies working together to try and get this done quicker? Because there is always you know, urgency, particularly now. Um, and I just feel it has become a, a, a major issue for me. The other, the other question I just wanted to ask is, I know that we have, um, the government has approved the new first planning regulator. Um, this is to do with, of course, our planning framework 2040. Um, I, I, I don't know if I can announce his name, but I'm sure you can. I mean, I mean yeah, uh, Niall Cushion, isn't it? Yeah. Is that pronounced right? Yes. Yeah. Cushion. Cushion. Okay. Now, that's very welcome. And in the sense of, I think, going forward, we should probably always have had one. And I believe his role will be vital for everybody because he is there to work with all different agencies. And I just want to know his role, what will his role be with your own department, uh, David? And even like for local authorities, because it's so important, because as you see, and, and you're probably aware, and this has come to my attention several times, when you appeal to onboard Planola as a group, it's 220. For a singular, if you were you know, applying, it's 50 euro. Has that been a problem? Do you feel that there won't be an increase in this? Have you looked at this? Like with this new uh, planet, this new on online uh, scheme that you're bringing up, will there be fees on that? Because fees have become an issue and, and it has been brought to my attention on regular, uh, you know, people maybe can't afford it. Because mo in fairness, I understand there has to be transparency and everybody wants that. But I always believe that people would always only object for proper reasons and I always believe we, we need to have, have them looked at. So maybe overall, could you come back to me on the fees? Could you come back to me on the new planning uh, regulator? And also just about local authorities and the role that they're playing. I'm delighted that there's a rec new recruitment for planners. I think that has been a massive issue. And I think that will actually help in terms of, as well, in, in, the, in the bigger picture. But maybe if you could come back to me just on the time scale, on the staffing, on the minister's new, uh, what he's thinking about bringing in. He's looking at legislation. Maybe you could answer a few of them for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Senator. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you're right. The time scale, kind of where people are waiting a year for, for an okay. appeal, is is not kind of is not acceptable from 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 the boards and it's not not somewhere that we wanted to be i think there has been a confluence of of, of internal challenges in terms of there was a, a kind of a, a small number of board members which meant that there were a limited number of cases that could go before them um, we actually as loretta said we had implementation of a brand new system across the organization which meant that people from a file coming through that they've been used to working in paperwork Everything had to go onto the system. You had to refine the system. In the middle of the process, the board took on new functions in terms of strategic housing. So we actually had to redesign and build in kind of the new strategic housing, 100 plus houses into that system. And also, I think kind of um, obviously there's a, a large intake of cases and recruitment and making sure that we had not only the right number of people but the right skill set to actually deliver it. And with cases being more complex than that, you need more resources to put into it. And certainly, kind of. Um, you know, maybe I'm in a, a position where I'm as much looking forward as looking back. I recognise, and I think the organisation accepts that you know we have to change from where we were. And I think certainly our objective and our plan to get to to, to be able to deliver all cases within 18 weeks um, by the summer, and then kind of make sure I maintain that level. But we have actually brought through some initiatives. So we have dealt with 
Um, we have created what we call free flow cases, smaller cases like extensions, where we actually do try and look at kind of prioritising and making sure that if cases can be dealt with quickly through the inspectorate and through the board, that we should try and make sure that they are dealt with, that they aren't kind of tied up because there are other schemes that are there. Um, and indeed, actually, kind of, I think 96% of the smaller cases actually are dealt with within that 18-week period. So again, it can be done, but it doesn't suit every single kind of project. Um, but certainly we will improve, and certainly as we develop the system, we will refine it and we will become more efficient. Um, on the question of um, observations or, or submissions and appeals, I suppose the board treats every submission that it, it gets in the same way. We actually, whether it comes from an individual, a group, we look at everything that comes in in the file, we look at what happens, the history of the, the local authority, so if it's an appeal for something, we will get the full papers from the local authority. Um, and I think the point and the, the, the benefits and the value of having a, an impartial board is that actually we can look at it, we can kind of assess it in its entirety, and we come to a kind of a, a robust and, and, and kind of defensible situation and, and, and decision. Um, and I think that is something that kind of I'm not saying that there's any more kind of appeals. The numbers of, uh, of appeals are, are growing smaller, but, that, but that's actually reflecting probably more the activity that's happening kind of rather than there are more people that are objecting and, and, and complaining. And indeed, many people write in in support of, of developments as well. So it's not, yeah. it's not all kind of just um, mm. you know, blocking activity, yeah. but certainly the, the number of cases that we're, be, we're able to deal with and process, I think, reflects the fact that um, we are still kind of efficiently getting through kind of and dealing with it, but reflecting kind of the, the very clear statutory requirements for us to take all views into account. Um, you're right, I think kind of there is an upsurge in, in planning activity, and I think it's, it is great that local authorities are actually kind of uh, getting the resources they need mm -hmm. in their planners, and it's not just in relation to development management, it's in development planning, yeah. and, and obviously the national planning framework and the regional plans will need to be reflected and, and built into to, to city, county, and indeed local plans. Uh, from the board's perspective, we have, we have over 50 planners, um, but again, kind of the complexity of some of the cases we have, we need to make sure that we have not only the right skill set, but also the, 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 the expertise to actually efficiently process those cases. Um, obviously, it's a matter for, for the Minister and, and the Department to ensure that the resourcing is provided to the local authorities to do that, and likewise, we are a planning authority, so the planning regulator, um, Niall Cusson, will have a very important role. This was actually a role that was flagged back in the, um, it's back in the, uh, the Mahan Tribunal report in 2012-2013, right, yeah. um, and I think it has taken a while, but I think certainly the time is right as we're ramping up activity. Um, um, the role of the regulator will be to assess kind of how the system is working mm. at local level, is there consistency, and it's not actually kind of a, as it, it is a policing role, but it's also a supportive and a facilitating role. There are efficiencies, there is best practice that can be shared across local authorities, and also being able to assess uh, and address some of the issues that uh, Senator Boyan had about the, the perceived or indeed the the, uh, the temporal inconsistencies between what might be in local plans and what might be in, in yeah, national guidance, a... that is something I think that the regulator will have a very strong role and we will be subject to the, the scrutiny of the regulator as well. So how we perform as a planning body, we will also be answering to and subject to the, uh, the role of the regulator who is independent in his functions. Um, I think the, the, the last question um, in relation to appeal um, fees and that obviously the fees are something that the board proposes and are set by the minister yeah. um, and again as part of improving kind of the system and that um, we may take the opportunity once once planet is um, is yeah, rolled yes. out and available to look and see kind of um, whether the fees are proportionate or not I don't think the fees have, have changed that much in the last 10 plus years no, I think um, really so again it's a question of you know what is the right level of fee to facilitate people to participate in the process but also ensure that you know, there's a certain amount of cost recovery. And, and your last kind of question was just around, um, I suppose, the issue of zoning kind of and, and, and local area plans. Obviously, the development plan process, again, is set down in legislation um, and it'll be a matter for the department, but it is a long period, but that long period reflects, I suppose, the need for engagement and, and opportunities through two public consultation processes to actually have adequate debate among the councillors and looking at seeing kind of how kind of uh, a scheme will evolve and, and kind of I suppose the context for planning is changing so quickly that a six-year development plan you know it may be very different when it comes to the next six-year plan 
but there are opportunities to vary plans, obviously. So in many cases, uh, plans will be varied once the regional plans are in place. Um, and it's a matter for, for, for the local government to prioritise that system and obviously to work with the department. And just on the clarifying of the objections, for the minister was on about clarifying objections. Um, he spoke about that a few weeks back. What is your opinion on that, where he was saying about uh, maybe the neighbour next door might feel that, you know, he doesn't want houses beside him, so he's looking at putting something in place, so... Well, I think, I, I, I suppose the, the issue there, Senator, is actually that, you know, if someone wishes to make a submission... I think they should be left. Yeah. Well, they, they, they can, and actually, yeah. kind of, to make an appeal, the fee is actually €220 Euros for... Yes. There's different categories, yeah. but to make a submission or an observation is €50. Euros. Um, so, again, the system is there to facilitate people to make their views known, and obviously the board, like local authorities, will take on view, uh, kind of take on, take on board whatever views have been expressed in coming to uh, their final decisions. And that's okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Uh, maybe take equally my opportunity to wish Dave well in, in, in his new role and indeed Noel in his role as a planning regulator. Uh, two significant people have been lost to the department and a huge hole to fill within the department. Yet, <laughs> just I suppose I'll try and focus on the processes as, as, as opposed to anything else and maybe make a few comments on, on other issues. I just feel today that this 18 weeks, unended 18 weeks, is totally unacceptable in today's environment. And I fail to see why that can't be put in the statute that a decision has to be made in 18 weeks, one way or another. We brought it in in the local authorities many years ago where they were forced to make the decision in eight weeks. I think the board should be under the same thing, whether it's 18 weeks or 20 weeks or 12 weeks, but a decision must be made. I think it's unfair on anybody out there who has to go through an appeal process not knowing when that decision is going to be made. Whether it's in business or whether it's your family home, it doesn't make any difference. You should be, as a basic entitlement, know to when that decision is made. I acknowledge your work on trying to address that, but 40% is nowhere near where we, where we need to be. But I think it shouldn't be there. I don't think you should have that option in the first place. I think the decision, in my opinion, should be made within that statute process and it shouldn't be extended. Dave, you've come and you've been part of the strategic housing development process, do you know what I mean, of moving that towards the board. You have the strategic infrastructure process with the board at the moment and you have the site valuation with the board at the moment. Looks like a lot of planning is going to the board and, and bypassing the local authority. But just from an observation point of view, there's three different types of planning processes there. You know, I suppose what I'm trying to get to and what the public out there have sort of, you know, it's very hard to understand the planning process to the general public. Even as public reps sometimes, it gets very complicated. But now that you're dealing with three different types, is there a model or is there something coming forward out of that that is a more transparent or more consistent way, because you do the word of consistent consistency in, in decision making. And I think that's what the public want to see. They want to see consistencies. It's very hard out there for the general public to understand how decisions are made. And it's very important that we do get consistencies in, in relation to the decision making process. Um, so maybe just ask, asking your opinion in relation to the three different processes that you're probably dealing with at the moment. Uh, just in relation to the figures, and the, one of the charts he gave us, I think, you know, you're looking at 1,200, 1200 appeals are in relation to residential development. And out of that, there's quite a significant single one-off rural housing appeals, I think. There's in excess of over 400 or something one-off rural houses, um, which raises a concern as a person who's come from a rural area and has been through the rural planning process. I find that staggeringly high. That, that, that that level of appeal process is there in relation to the one-off rural houses um, and is there anything we should be doing to try and prevent that happening or not prevent it but you know deal with issues at council level that is not you know ending up in in with the board to deal with because I have my own views on the whole planning process around one-off rural housing that there's not enough consultation being done with the applicant at local authority level and a lot of stuff could be earned out that might you know, end up taking up your time. Um, 
Just a few observations in relation to the national planning framework, regional plans and the county plans and I have to say, while supportive of that logic of that, you know, the sequencing, it has now, in my own county, has put a number of local area plans completely out of sync. And even when I mentioned the Newtown Mount Kennedy plan is now going is now will be sixteen years before it has a new local area plan because we rolled it in, in the time of the crash. We just rolled it over because nothing was happening. That six-year period ended last year. Now we're told we have to get into sequence with the national planning framework. So the regional plan will be adopted. Information coming through is now we won't be able to do a variation of our county plan. We will have to redo the county plan. And Newtown Mount Kennedy in the meantime may wait until the county plan. So we could be another three years before Newtown Mount Kennedy will have a local area plan. And similarly, in relation to Wicklow Town and Varnes plan was meant to be done this year, that's now going to be kicked down the road. So there is, you know, and a lot of development is beginning to happen now in both these areas, but yet they won't have a local area plan in place to deal with, with, with the itch, itch situation. And moving on to policy and county development plan policy versus national plan policy, or maybe even EU policy further, up, up the line. We've had a lot of controversial things around the wind energy and, and, and we have had county policy being overruled by national policy but yet at the moment there's no national policy we're still waiting from the strategy in relation to wind. And we have currently a lot of application in relation to solar farms where there is literally no policy around and some authorities are not making the decision because there's no policy. Like, what's going to happen around that whole area where there actually is no policy in relation to to um, to the information. I equally just going back, I forgot to mention, I welcome that I plan or it plan, what plan your planet <laughs> coming forward. I think it's a it, you know it's a pity it's not there now, but I can understand it is how how important it is moving forward. And it just it just makes the whole press more transparent to the public when they can access all this information freely on, online. And I think even in our own county plan process, when you show people that you can actually get everything online, you don't, it makes them more comfortable with the system and makes them feel that the system is more transparent. Equally, I think the same will be with the board. Your own website at the moment could do with probably a, a rehash. It's very hard to make your, try, make your way around it. Just a few, and I might come back on, the, on a few points when you come back, Dave. Thanks very much. Um, I think, kind of, I suppose there, the core issue there as to whether the statutory objective period should be a cut-off or not, and I think, kind of, certainly in the, in the context of that kind of issue, it's been discussed kind of between the department and, and this committee, and indeed has been debated uh, in, in the Oireachtas through, through various pieces of legislation. The the system is the system that we're currently implementing and kind of until the, the, the government and the, uh, and, and the Iraq change the legislation, we'll deal with it. I, I think certainly we have learned lessons and I think you, you look at the SHD process and you say we have been able to deliver all cases within 16 weeks and indeed the Iraq built in um, a safeguard that said, well, if you go over the 16 weeks, there's a penalty for, for the board. Um, how that has been actually able to be delivered is because there have been, I suppose, kind of a very clear structure of pre-application consultations between the local authority, the developer, and the board. So everyone understands um, how, how kind of, uh, what is expected, what are the kind of key drivers, what is the appropriate use of the site. And then we drive forward and we have resourced an SHD team dedicated at admin and, uh, and inspector level within the organization to ensure that actually we can meet those 16 week deadlines. But the reality is, you know, kind of, there are limitations to the SHD in terms of if we were to hold an oral hearing, if we were looking for further information, you know, that actually process would require us to be going kind of to need more time to actually enable people to comment, to, to send in further information, to see what comes in so that there's transparency in the file, to participate in an oral hearing. So I think it's very difficult to be able to identify that in every single case, um, you know, where you actually want to have ensure that the board has sufficient information before it to actually make a robust decision. And I think also when you take in, into account 
some of the European directives and, and requirements where you have actually kind of uh, environmental impact um, assessment reports, you actually have appropriate assessment. Again, these are processes that add time to both the evaluation but also to the circulation and participation by stakeholders, other departments and that. Certainly, um, until such time as um, the Oireachtas or the Minister says we're changing the system, we will actually drive and make sure that as far as we can, and, and maybe just to point to the fact that where we have been able to identify particular types of schemes, so those free flow, those smaller types, we're hitting 96%. There's always going to be one or two cases where we don't have enough information and we do have to go back out. And that might take four or five weeks because someone replies and then we ask the local authority to respond or, or, or other observers. Um, but certainly kind of we are looking to make the system more efficient. And in, in the context, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the strategic infrastructure is a huge, uh, hugely important role for the board. And I recognize that you might feel that, oh, it's something that's, that's been kind of uh, evolved and kind of moved into the board from, from local government um, and the planning process. But we have, we have processed and, and uh, adjudicated on about 110, 111 cases since 2006, 2007, when the SI functions came into the board. Uh, and these are obviously large-scale projects. They're, they're major kind of schemes, roads, infrastructure, kind of, um, but also they actually kind of, um, they have provided, I suppose, a lot of the building blocks for what we see as being the necessary investment needed for business, commercial, residential activity to actually happen um, as, as, as demand for, for, for development increases. So I actually think we are looking at our systems and our processes there learning lessons from strategic housing and seeing well, what, what lessons can we learn about transparency and communication um, to streamline, say, pre-application consultations, but recognizing that where you do have complex cases, they mightn't be as straightforward as you know, a housing development where you might have a lot of uh, in interactions with heritage, with environmental issues. But certainly, I think there is certain, certainly room for um, greater efficiencies and streamlining of those processes, and that's something we're going to be prioritizing the first half of this year. Um, the issue, I think, you touched on it right at the end. You said, you know, if we had a, a, a clearer system and, and, and a, a better communication for how we make decisions, for people to understand the system, um, and I think a website and certainly kind of the development and the the modernization of a website, you know, is, is one of our top priorities, and I think Loretta is kind of uh, very eager to, to, to really kind of move with the times and ensure that we have it. We've obviously had to prioritize our internal kind of uh, planet kind of improvements first. And I think as we now have the system running, on, running kind of live within the organization, we're certainly turning our attention to it. And part of that is about making information fully available so people can go on and navigate the department or the, um, the board's website. But also I think it's the language that we use and I think it was touched on by, uh, by, by, Senator, by the two senators, actually, around kind of how we explain kind of how the system works and basically kind of to remove some of the, the jargon from the system that's there uh, as far as we can. Um, and I think kind of I might actually ask Rachel just to come in on the issue of um, LAPs, and kind of our one-off rural housing and, and, and the high rates and that. I suppose the one thing to say is that we are obviously a body that is on development management. So we actually deal with applications that come through and appeals, um, the processes around development plans being out of date on LAPs. It, it, it is a challenge and I think there, there, there are consequences for having kind of plans that maybe don't reflect the current context or reality of it. And that is, I suppose, where the board has to take a very balanced view and looking at what are the latest and, and up-to-date policies around environmental, around planning and, and, and other elements, as well as looking at what are the local objectives. Um, but again, I maybe kind of, that's something that the new regulator, I think, should be looking at in terms of how do you address the issue of consistency between the regional, the county, and the local plans, and actually and which ones should be taking precedence, and how is, is there better ways to ensure that there is consistency between it? Um, and I think maybe on, on the wind energy side as well, you might just maybe touch on briefly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I suppose just to, to finish out there on the issue of out-of-date local area plans and in particular in relation to the strategic housing applications, you know, we've had a very positive um, interaction with the planning authorities who recognise and are hamstrung by the fact that some of their plans are quite out-of-date um, and they are very supportive of the proposals coming in, but 
notwithstanding that they don't comply 100% to their development plans or local area plans, because of the passage of time and the delays in having to review them, brought about by obviously the changing national and then ultimately regional policy context. So, uh, in a way, the strategic housing allows those go ahead, and you'll find that notwithstanding that the the board are allowing and facilitating material contraventions of plans, they are actually being supported by the planning authority because of that time lag. The others, unfortunately, are, are perhaps not in such a, an advantageous position. But again, that depends on the particular cases and um, I suppose the rationale being put forward at appeal stage. Um, in relation to the um, Rural housing element, I, all I would say is um, that it's not just actual first party appeals. So just in case you think that it's, you know, uh, all the applicants are appealing the decision, actually a number of the decisions, a significant number of the decisions are actually appealed by third parties. So while pre-application consultation assists the applicant, our system allows for third parties to be involved and to have a say, and that actually will also um, relate. And then again, the other element that keeps up that figure high is that sometimes it'll be um, an issue of not the principle, but the design and the conditioning and so on. So again, just it looks quite a dramatic figure within the context of residential as a whole, but there are, but it's not just applicants being refused and having to appeal. There, there's a multiple reasons. Then in relation to wind energy and solar energy and so on and the lack of national policy perhaps or guidelines in relation to that, I suppose what I would say is there's a, a general policy or national context in terms of a positivity towards renewable energy and we know that we have to move towards renewable energy. So in principle, you know, we should be looking positively at renewable energy. We then look at the local context, local development plans um, and county development plans and so on to ensure that there aren't particular issues that, that would influence the, the decision making because ultimately the board will look at each case on a site-by-site -site basis and look at the proper planning and sustainable development so that, yes, we support <coughs> renewable energy, but if um, there is a negative or adverse impact that is brought to the attention uh, by either the, the planning authority or by objectors, then that will obviously um, be brought into consideration. So just because there isn't a, a policy or a specific guidance in relation to it, which obviously would be very, very helpful, um, the board are still in a position to actually look at these in a, a very holistic way. But as Dave said, these are some of the application types or some of appeal types, because they don't all fall into SID and solar doesn't fall into SID at all. These are some of the appeal types that take longer than the 18 weeks because they are new. There isn't always a policy context, whether nationally or locally. And so therefore, sometimes they've oral hearings. Sometimes we have to go back and circulate information, look for more information, because it is a very new field. And so these are the ones that at the when we are actually operating at full efficiency, these are part of the 15% that take us a little bit longer to ensure that we have a consistent approach across the board. And, and maybe just kind of just to address one point I think that I, I, I omitted, um, going back to the issue of the customer service and what, you know, kind of what our ultimate driver is to basically make the system more accessible, easier to understand. We're obviously very closely working with the local authorities, the CCMA and their e-planning team. So um, we actually sit on the, the steering group for e-planning and we're aligning ourselves so that as and when they, they pilot out their scheme for online applications in the first instance, we will be ready to actually take any online appeals so that we will be moving into a very kind of, I suppose, aligned and, and synchronized system. And obviously separately, as you say, there are some cases that, that do come our way, you know, directly housing, large infrastructure, uh, and we deal with those kind of, you know, so we'll be taking kind of new applications as well as dealing with appeals. And that's something that we're very clearly kind of focused on and ensuring that, you know, hopefully by this time next year, we'll be able to talk about how the, the new system is, is actually kind of, uh, is, in, is, is close to being in place, if not in place, and making it a lot easier to, uh, to make appeals and to see what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, first of all, look, just to put on record, um, in, in all of the engagements I and my staff have had with, with Onboard Planola, I have to say that the staff response has always been incredibly professional and, and incredibly quick, uh, and I just want to acknowledge that and, uh, and thank them, because sometimes, given your web difficulties, which I'll come to in a, in a minute, it is often very hard to find information, but when you follow it up with a phone call, you always get the information very, very quickly, so I just want to acknowledge that, uh, um, and that could be passed on to the staff. 
two general comments and then I have some specific questions. Um, I, I'm of a view, I, I share Pat's view, um, uh, not only would I have a, a, a strict statutory limit, I would have a shorter statutory limit for the majority of cases because from my understanding of the majority of cases, not those outliers or exceptionally long ones, you're reviewing substantive assessments that have already been made. So in fact, not only should it be strict, it should be shorter in my view. That's not a decision for you and I accept your position. Um, I assume it is a resources issue. Um, I mean, the reason why local authorities can do it in eight weeks is because there are 30 odd of them and therefore they're processing all of those applications. But I do think at some point, and this is a matter we can raise with, with government at, at some other stage, we need to get to a point where uh, those timelines are much more fixed and much more streamlined for the average cases. I also want to make a comment just on, on the, the political debate that has started, which weren't actually questions that you guys could answer, but I think it's important to point out. I have a different view to the other members who've expressed so far. I do think third party opinions are an important part of our planning process. And I say opinions, not objections, because there are lots of opinions that go in that aren't objections. They're suggested improvements, amendments, uh, etc. And I think that's valid. I do have to say, though, there is a huge amount of hypocrisy in the political process. I'm not going to name any politician or name any case, uh, but I see regularly politicians put in uh, objections to developments, and it is not on planning grounds. It is on purely electoral grounds, and I just think that has to be said. However, where I think the minister is wrong is most of those opinions have no impact on the planning decisions, and nor should they. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen planning submissions from politicians that make no planning points whatsoever, and the politician actually knows it's not going to have any negative impact, but wants to be seen uh, electorally to be opposing something. In fact, in one particular occasion, I saw politicians who actually wanted a development to go ahead deliberately putting in objections opposing it, but knowing full well it would have no material impact. So I'm not asking you to comment on that. I want to put it on the record because other members have raised it, is that um, I think there is a failure of leadership on behalf of some politicians to engage with residents to try and ensure that where development does happen, it's done in a sensible way. But I also think there's a lot of misinformation out there that just because a politician objects that has an impact. In fact, I would be very worried, and my, my experience in South Dublin County Council is almost no political objection has any planning impact whatsoever because the quality of the objections are so poor and not rooted in planning regulation. And I just think, in light of last night's programme, it's important for us to, to be clear about that. What I would say is, on a more general point, we do have to look at levelling the playing field for genuine third-party opinion makers who want to improve development but don't have the technical expertise. And in other jurisdictions, for example, they have non-governmental organisations that can assist residents not to oppose something, but to say, well, how can this happen in a way that meets the needs of the developers, whether it's a hospital, a school or housing, and the local community? And I think if there was greater support for third party, particularly community-based third party opinions, it could actually improve the process overall. And I just want to make that point. Specific questions, David. So first of all, on, on the 60% of cases that are above the 18 weeks, can you give us some information in terms of how many are six months, 12 months, or, or, and if you don't have the information, maybe you can provide it in tabular form at a later stage so we have a kind of a quantifiable f picture for it. I also think it's important, I, I would always use the phrase four and a half months because 18 weeks just sounds short. Uh, and four and a half months is a long time. Uh, and I know some of these are incredibly complex, complex cases. I'm not trying to minimize it. But, but I would like to see you know, how many are eight months, 12 months, 16 months, 18 months. Uh, to get a sense of, of all of that. Uh, on the strategic housing development, and you'll remember, of course, uh, I didn't support the legislation uh, um, uh, at the time, but of the cases that have been through the board, uh, of the applications, can you give us the average timeline from start to finish? Um, because obviously the 48 weeks was the, the problematic length of time uh, for the 15 or so cases that were used by the department at the time to justify the introduction of the legislation so i'd be interested to know how much better are you doing than that average 48 weeks from the, the spreadsheet from the 2015 large housing developments that was given to the committee at that stage again if you don't have the information if you could send it on to us subsequently um how are you going to get to the 80 percent um I, I think it's great if you do it you, you'll have uh, uh, this committee uh, commending you and all of your staff but you haven't got a dramatic increase of resources. I know there's more board members, et cetera. That's a big commitment that you've made, that you're going to you know, get to that level of compliance midway to, to, to the end of, 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 of the year. Uh, so maybe if you can talk us through that. Um, um, and then on the website, um, I suppose, I was going to ask the question, but you've kind of answered part of it, which is, is that's a major area. 
There's been huge improvements in local authority planning um, sections, websites, um, so that not only is it easier to search for stuff, but for example, the interactive mapping tools that they now have are just wonderful. Like in Settlement County Council, where, where I am, you know, often I, I want to know about a planning application and I've no notion what the reference is and I just go on the map and I can see and it gives me all the planning history and will your site eventually not only have functionality in terms of allowing us to access decisions and files, but will you have that kind of mapping tool? Is that something you hope to get to? Uh, because if you did, that would be an enormous, I think, advance for everybody and it would be uh, more than welcome. And sorry, one, one question, a second bit to the to how would you get to the 80%. What, what is holding you back? I mean, is it simply those historic legacy issues of smaller board members and less staff? You know, what, 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 I suppose, what is the explanation? Because if they are all just legacy things, then clearly, you know, you're, you're going to be much more able to, to meet the, the 80%. But if they're not just legacy issues, are there other issues in there that we should be aware of? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, so Owen, Dave. Thanks so much, Deputy, and um, appreciate the comments. Uh, I, I note your, your, your first few comments, and I probably won't give a, give a view on those. Um, but I think just, again, kind of a, a happy, I don't have a, a breakdown of, of, of actually how many kind of cases and where they are mm. and how many are 12 plus months or whatever. Mm. The one thing that I, I have been very clear um, when I went into the board was to look at what are the longest and the oldest cases that mm. are there and to actually ensure that they are put to the top of the pile and addressed because... You know, if I was somebody that's waiting 12 months for a decision and you realize that someone else's decision that's in there for four mm. months or three and a half months is actually getting you're kind of saying, well, so by actually kind of saying and, and focusing on cases that are well beyond the four and a half months, um, and indeed kind of I would say the vast majority of cases that we dealt with um, in the first few, the last few months of the year, the 600 odd cases are kind of cases that you know, we're already over the 18 weeks. So therefore, by actually kind of making decisions on those, it didn't improve. In fact, it disimproved our percentage. But yeah. when you look back, and certainly from, from talking to, to Rachel and, and, and the planning team, we're at a point where kind of cases where the decision dates kind of were due kind of um, in the latter half of the year, we're now actually up to where the four and a half month period in most cases is probably November or December. So we're actually now kind of sweating it back mm. that, okay, there are still two or three months of cases that still need to be resolved. You'll obviously have some of the larger cases that required significant further information, sure. ecological reports, you know, full year studies. Um, and I think there are some that will actually obviously skew and be almost kind of, you know, historic cases. And there actually, there are some other cases where we have actually opened cases through pre-application discussions and the legislation as it stands doesn't allow the board to actually close it. It actually, it requires the applicant to actually close. So there probably are maybe kind of 50 or 60 cases that might be on our books that actually are never going to happen, but they're actually kind of existing. And again, that's something that we'll be kind of engaging with the department to see, can we kind of amend and improve legislation so that there isn't this, I suppose, anomaly that they're sitting out there. But we can happy to provide further information, but certainly in terms of the bulk of the cases that we have, we're now kind of maybe in kind of the last two or three months of, of kind of bringing them back. And that, I suppose, partly answers your second question is to, are we being too ambitious? How are we actually going to deliver this? The, 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 the statutory objective period is 18 weeks. We're currently at about 22, 22 and a half weeks for average. So, okay, there are some kind of, obviously will be done quicker and some that won't, but certainly there's a bulk of, of, of focus that we will be looking at in the first six months and if you take it on average that we're getting about 250 cases a month. Mm. So you're saying, well, over the next three or four months, we'll be working through the remaining of that backlog that we can, obviously cases that, that actually have enough information for mm. us to go to the board. The fact that we have 10 board members, as opposed to four board members back in, um, in May or June 2017, means that we can actually have a number of board meetings going on at the same time. So, the, the minimum quorum for, for normal board meetings is three. So with 10 people, you could actually have three board meetings going on concurrently. Um, uh, obviously, there's, there's, there's larger kind of schemes like SHD, kind of there's, there's more numbers there. And I think the legacy challenge that we had, and I would, I would hope that it is, a, it is a legacy issue, is that, as, as Loretta said, when we brought in our new system, you had, we weren't able to say, 
staff applications coming in for a month while we kind of take our time and we went in with live kind of cases and from a particular date we actually said we're taking them in and we're putting them in the system. So our entire team from people in reception to those that are processing it to ensure that actually kind of the system worked, that actually kind of so there was a certain and a necessary slowdown that would always happen when you transition. Um, and I think that kind of, you know, very quickly, if you lose a month or two months, well, suddenly you've got 500 cases, 600 cases that, you know, you're behind and then you're chasing and do you go with the ones that are old or not? So I would say that if, as I outlined, that we can actually kind of put the resources in and tackle it and be innovative, like I kind of, um, we initiated some, um, some extra working, some overtime, uh, we used an incentivized case where some planners would actually take extra cases and deal with them out of normal office hours, you know, kind of um, to, to ensure that we could actually clear some of that backlog. I think continuing that and getting the support from the department for the, not only the, the resources that we feel we need, because we do expect to see both more cases coming through and more complex cases coming through. So if you have a case where an inspector or a team is no longer tied up for three months, but for six or nine months in dealing with a, a huge file, that means you don't have an inspector to deal with other cases mm -hmm. that might come through. But it's not so much, it's, it's not about throwing just solely bodies at it. It's actually about making sure that we have people in the right locations. We're hiring, as I said, an ecologist. We're, we're going to be bringing in business analysts and, and program managers to ensure that we keep Planet on, on track. And, and I would be confident and, and, and I, I feel very reassured from how the board has operated and how the team, as you say, kind of a, a very professional team in the organization that if we set ourselves to, to, to work back so that by the end of the year, I think in a year, in a 12 month kind of context, we probably will be at 60 to 70 percent, but mm. by the, because of the legacy issues in the first half. But for the last quarter, I would expect to be 80 percent plus mm. and to maintain that as we go forward and to make sure that the organization isn't maybe, um, isn't kind of facing the same challenges in, into the future. But, you know, it's, it's something that I feel that we're ready to do and, and I feel we have it. But the workforce plan will further, I suppose, support and, and identify any kind of deficits that we need in the resourcing side. On the mapping piece, um, we will actually be building in a, a GIS system. Obviously, kind of there's a, the wider my plan that the department led and has local authority is very much more from a, from a zoning perspective and seeing kind of designations. We've been building, as, as, as uh, Loretta said, the GIS element was the second phase of, of our planet project. So when the website goes live, you will actually have GIS and interactive. And I think the key thing is, going back to the, uh, the issue with, with uh, Deputy Casey, it is about having a joined up system. Like we can't have you know, the board doing something and the local authorities doing something else. So there has to be that synergy and, and, and sharing. Um, and I actually, I think in terms of maybe just the other issue you had about kind of, you know, kind of the, the, the intensity, I suppose, of the work. So if, if you were to try and deliver kind of um, cases more quickly, it, it, it probably would come down to resources and ensuring that we have timely, you know, feedback from statutory bodies, mm -hmm. from the local authority. And even as it is, SHD kind of has worked and we've, we've put a huge amount of focus and resources, but it is hugely work intensive. And the, the average time for the, strategic, for the strategic housing developments from start to finish of the, of the ones you've of, Well, of, of the SHDs that actually, r rather than the appeals that have come through, is it? Um, I suppose what, what I'm really interested to know is, is that piece of legislation was sold to the committee on the basis of there was an identified problem of a 48-week mm -hmm. turnaround from start to finish, including board appeals on about 15 or 16 large housing right. developments in 2015. You'll remember the mm -hmm. torturous committee proceedings we had. What I want to know is, all in from start to finish, of all of the cases that you've dealt with, uh, how long are they taking? What's the average? So that we can compare, is this legislation doing it faster? And faster doesn't necessarily mean better, by the way, but is it doing it faster? Um, Every single of our... Of our yeah, so there's obviously a nine-week pre-app kind of consultation yeah. and then 16 weeks to determine when an application yeah. comes through. We have met um, in 100% of cases... You've met that that's target. Yeah, six, yeah. The 16 weeks, and in fact, we've been able to make decisions, you know, kind of a, a week or two sooner where we, where we have the information to hand. Because yeah. so there's actually, no appeals process. I mean, that's, no. that's, that's, that's start that's to finish. Yeah. Yeah. So from an application coming through, you know, following a, a pre-application yeah. process, 16 weeks and less is actually kind of... 
but from the, the, the pre-app stage, it's, it's a nine, weeks, it's nine weeks plus it's nine the 16 weeks. weeks. Yeah. So it's statutorily set down, yeah. and that includes obviously the, the Chief Executive's report, which takes on board councillors' views as which well. Which kind of as proves Pat's point. When you get a tough statutory deadline, it's hard to miss it. Well, again, kind of in taking a particular type of, uh, sure. of scheme as well. So yeah. it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all, yeah. but I think, so going back to the point, I think there are lessons that we can learn and certainly kind of um, systems that we can, we can look to see are there other types and maybe subsets of, of projects that could actually kind of benefit from a tighter time frame, whether it's set statutorily or whether it's a, one that we would set ourselves. But I think certainly. And just a final question, how many pre-app SHDs haven't gone to formal application? I might ask her <laughs> to put that one. She okay. had the numbers. So uh, we have 97 pre-application consultations. In, in total since the legislation came in? Yeah, we, it, it would appear larger because we've 117 received, but obviously, well not obviously, but 20 of them uh, were invalidated for one reason or another and, and repeated and came back in again. So we've okay. 97 valid. And then we have, um, sorry, uh, and then um, of those, then we have 40 uh, applications decided and 20 on hand, so 60. So um, we're kind of beginning to, to, to ramp it up. Obviously, at the very start, um, we could only be involved in pre-application. Mm -hmm. So when day one hits, obviously, you've got a nine-week lag of the, of, mm -hmm. of the pre-apps coming through. So, but what we've noticed, actually, is that towards the end of 2018, so Q4 2018, we had a significant number of pre-application consultations. Mm -hmm. So it was on average nearly 20 per month over that few um, mm. months and again an increase in um, application numbers so we would anticipate 2019 <coughs> being busier because um, the uh, pre-application consultations are um, more dense and more intense at the latter part and it'll take time because what happens is uh, there's actually a large proportion of those pre-application consultations require further consideration so it's nine weeks and we've been delivering within the nine weeks but then the applicant has to go back, maybe have further conversations with the planning authority before they come back in. But that said, all of them are coming in uh, okay. within a relatively tight time frame. There may be a couple of months where they're coming back into us. So th this is important, if the chair will indulge, indulge me, because he, he, knows, he knows where I'm going with this. Okay. So on the basis of what you've said, th David, your answer isn't really comparing like with like. So if we go back to the 15, right? That 48-week period, because I think this is a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a genuine thing for us to look at, that 48-week period was all in. It was from the, the, the day the pre-planning application went in to the day there was a final board decision, for example. And that included all the things like developers putting in bad, badly done applications and having to come back or extended uh, uh, additional information requests, etc. So I suppose what I would really like, and David, your answer doesn't give it to me, is... In all of the applications, how do we actually compare like with like? So, for example, if, if you know, there was, what is it, uh, 27 or 20-odd applications were, pre-applications were lodged, but then they were sent back because they weren't valid. And then I presume they've come back in and they're included. You know, the 97 is the unique number rather yes. than, right? Yeah. But, but the ones that were rejected and have come back in, they, you're not including that initial period where they rejected and then put back in in the calculation of your averages, oh, right? But, but that's because it only takes a day. Okay. There's uh, no time lost, it's okay. a day. But also, for example, are you saying then that between the pre-application, the nine weeks, and then yeah. the formal submission to the, the formal application of the board, yeah. there could be a gap in between there that's not counted in your 25 weeks? Yeah, it's typically uh, in and around a month, like four weeks. Okay. If, if an applicant has decided to proceed, some yeah. of them decide not to proceed, but assuming that they are going to proceed, and the timelines are very much dependent on whether it is they, the applicant wants to engage, but the board itself, the, the inspection board, don't cause any delay. I, I get that, but for example, one of the biggest delays in the 15 case studies was the delay in the applicant coming back with a request for further information. In some cases, it was six months, nine months, mm -hmm. etc. So that wasn't something that the local authority could control. They had asked for the additional information. and So I suppose if I was to ask what is the actual average time for the processing of these, you would need to include 
that period between the nine weeks and the 16 weeks. Now, if it's very short, that's great. Yeah. But I, I'd really like to know, comparably from start to finish, what's the actual average? So what you're saying is it, it would be more than the 25 weeks. And how, how could we have a comparison on that that allows us to really judge the improvement? And I presume there is an improvement, by the way, yeah. so it would be in your interest to... Well, kind of, maybe, and, and I, I don't have the kind of... Um, Obviously, if you're taking an average of, you know, four or five weeks you know, or a month, mm -hmm. kind of an average, you're up to 29, 30 weeks. But maybe kind of um, it might be easier if we communicate back to the board. We obviously have a set number of, 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 of cases that were pre-app and then have followed through. What, so would, be, we, what would be really great is, because we, we had this conversation with, when, when the department originally came in for the, the, the strategic housing developments, they had some kind of average figures, right? But, but they were hokey as hell. So we got the spreadsheet, if you remember. We mm -hmm. fought tooth and nail for the spreadsheet, with, which mapped it all out for all of those 15. Now, I'm not asking for, for a spreadsheet for all 117 you know, initial contacts, but I think a spreadsheet would be good so we can kind of see how that falls, the things that are inside and outside your control that, that would allow us to, if, if such a thing is possible. Mm -hmm. There is information, I think, on the website, both in relation to the pre-app consultations and, and also then applications that are there and, and, and dates, but we're happy to, to, to send this on to the, uh, to the committee on that. So. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll come back to that point. I'm going to be Thanks. interested in that point myself. Anthony, do you want to let Anthony and Aidan in? And we'll Thanks, come back. Uh, well, sure. yeah. um, uh, um, and I do appreciate the, the fact you give me some time here to, to speak and question on, on board Pinal. And Dave, I, I wish you all the best in, in your new role. Um, at the very start, you mentioned you had, um, and I'm a bit of a raw novice on this, so you'll forgive me if um, um, on, on some of the questions I might ask you. You mentioned you had 159 and a half uh, WTS whole time uh, staff. Does that include the board members, the actual decision makers? 10, 10 additional board members, so it's their staff, and then so it's 168 and a half whole time equivalents, including the 10 board members, 159, kind of, sorry, 159 and a half, and then 10 board members, so 169 and a half okay, is the whole time equivalent. I think you should include those in because they are the important people, well, actually, decision makers. Yeah, I, in my statement, actually, I had said 159 and 10 okay, board right, members. Okay, right, so. um, so just just clarifying that, that they were full time. Um, yeah. Paid staff. Uh, this, the second thing too as well, um, uh, with regard to the strategic housing developments, um, if I uh, want to make a submission locally, can I make it locally? Because it's not very clear from uh, your guidance for planning authorities. Can I make it locally or do I have to send it into the board? Um, and if you can't make it locally, is it possible going forward that uh, people uh, locally from, say, parts of the country that wouldn't be as, as uh, accessible to the board or accessible to getting um, submissions in, uh, can they be done at a local level, if you follow me? Yep. Because everything else has to be done. Things. Right? Um, just a question with regard to uh, what percentage is there a divergence between your um, inspector's reports and the board decision? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And... What is the time frame between an inspector's report in, uh, and uh, the board making a decision? Uh, and it's for, not for the mm -hmm. SHDs, but for ordinary um, either, uh, uh, appeals that are made. Um, <clears throat> just one thing that has been annoying me for a while, and it's probably to do with my own county in Kildare, uh, the NPF and the interpretation of NPF particularly Objective 19, um, and Rachel may understand what Objective 19 is. Uh, the first time I came across it in the board was uh, an application in Carlo, which the inspector granted it in April, but the board refused it in October, quoting NPF 19. Um, and I have spoken with the minister on that. and like. What, what I have a problem with is what the minister's intention was when he spoke about it in the Dahl and in the Shannon too. Senator, just before you, that's a decided case. Yes, it's a decided case. case. Oh, yeah, it's a decided case. Yeah, it's not, it's not a live case. No. Um, uh, what the minister's intention was and then what the board's interpretation is. And, and to my mind, that has caused untold problems, particularly in Kildare, because... 
that decision by the board was made in October, right, uh, middle of October, and from the 1st of November, decisions by Kildare County Council have included NPF 19. Uh, and virtually all refusals since then by Kildare County Council have included NPF 19. Um, and there is a real issue and concern out there that the interpretation taken by the board of what the minister's intentions might have been or might not have been have suddenly caused uh, fierce problems for people putting in uh, one-off planning applications. And they would qualify under either social or economic. Um, the reason why social is used is because from an EU perspective, we can't use the family, uh, close as a family. So what I would like to, you to explain to me or give me what your interpretation is of MPF 19, so that um, if there is a divergence between the Minister's intention when this was going through the doll and what your interpretation of it is, that we can sort out this issue. Um, uh, the last little question, which is on uh, SHD, you mentioned your quorum is normally for three. Uh, have you increased that for the SHDs? Uh, or you said, generally just speaking, there's more there. Do you request more than three? Or can you actually make the decision based on your quorum of three? Thanks so much, Senator. I, I, kind of, I might answer a few of them, and, and I think Rachel may be um, delighted to answer some of the... the uh, Okay. Not your questions regarding kind of uh, objective 19. Um, you, you, you asked kind of how long a board kind of um, has a file from when an inspector kind of hands it over. The 18 weeks is generally broken down into the first five weeks are around processing, around kind of validating an application, um, circulating information to the local authority, getting data from the local <laughs> authority if it's an appeal, uh, and obviously notifying other um, statutory bodies, so departments, if, if they need to be aware that an, applica an application has been appealed. Then there's a nine-week period where the inspector will actually have the file, will go out on site, inspect, will, will do the necessary research uh, to prepare kind of uh, the, the folder, and then the board has it for somewhere between three and four weeks uh, to actually make a decision within the 18-week period. So that is generally the timeline that we keep, obviously, um, where there are kind of issues around further information some of those timelines and requests may push out some of those. But on average, the board members would have three to four weeks so with the file. Just, you're clarifying for me that when a inspector makes his report and when you make your decision, it's usually three to four weeks. This specific case was a lot longer than that. And is what particular reason may cases you've identified that you... But the, the, surely the inspector's report who will make a recommendation and your decision... It shouldn't take well, this is, as suppose, long as six months. Well, this, this comes back to, I suppose, the issue of the backlog. So that's, that's, our, that's our timeline under the strategic objective period. So the 18 weeks is broken down. But as we said, we've actually been dealing with a backlog. So in that, and I don't actually know that particular no, case I'm, or the I'm, timeline I'm, I'm, for it. But I think kind of, you know, there are many cases where you know, we haven't been able to meet the 18-week period. And it's because either an inspector hasn't had the time to actually deal with it within the timeline he has, or it hasn't reached the board within, or there was other kind of reasons for it. But you asked, what is the normal kind of period? And that would be, if everything was working to plan and we had all the information, that is the timeline that we worked through. <coughs> so you, your second question was just in relation to what is the rate or divergence of, of, of inspectors uh, versus board decisions. Um, it's normally between somewhere in 10 and 15 percent. I think in 2017, it was around 12 and a half percent. And in, in some cases, obviously, it's kind of um, the, the board considering kind of whether to overturn a, a decision or a recommendation by the inspector to, to approve or indeed to, to refuse a, a permission. So it isn't kind of, um, it could be either way. It's not just kind of a, you know, all one way. And I think the, the importance of, of having the board, and I suppose going back to the whole point and premise of a board, is that you have a planning inspector who, who prepares... Uh, a, a file and, and assesses all the information but what you have from the board is you have a range of, of expertise you have architects you have engineers you have planners you have administrators uh, you have people who understand the policy and collectively 
they look at the review, they look at the file afresh, and they examine it and decide whether, in the context of consistency, um, there are decisions, you know, that in sometimes kind of merit either altering kind of conditions around kind of, or indeed deciding that uh, to go against the inspector's recommendation in, okay. in certain cases. Just, just uh, if you bear with me, uh, Chair, just a quick on, on following up on that. You mentioned that you, uh, your quorums is three. You like yep. maybe your own to speed it up. You'd have three trees. Uh, not each of those uh, three people in the group would have the expertise that you mentioned there. All board members may have it. And is it decided then on a vote, or is it unanimous, or is it two one, or what way? Well, Just give us a, a piece, a, an insight into that. Because, it, it's, it actually rests with the chair to decide what the actual number of a board. So I can call a full board on any file that I decide. But a minimum quorum is three, including a minimum quorum for, for the SHD. But we have five members designated, kind of. Um, in the legislation for the strategic housing kind of so board members but three of those at any one time people may not be available you don't want to have a quorum of five and have only five members because then kind of you may not be able to make efficient decisions within the timeline but i think in the context of obviously the we, we would record where there is a split decision so if there was um, a two one split or a three two or kind of five four um or kind of um but kind of in many cases, you know, the board would actually come to a, a collective view and, and record their decision. So is that actually what the, the vote is? Oh, no, is no. That, it's it's, it's it, on the public it, it, Well, it can be kind of in terms of actually the information. Um, it, it is actually kind of if there is a split, that information is, 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 is available. But if it's not there, it means it's in a unanimous decision. Thanks very much for indulging me on this, uh, Chair. No, no, OK. Um, do you Thank want you. to maybe oh, just... Uh, Question. Oh yeah, that's right. That's Grant. Well, I was actually I was about to kind of uh, kind of uh, ask Rachel maybe just to, to deal with the issue of Objective 19 and the board um, board interpretation, and maybe just to flag, I suppose, you know, the board's kind of um, the legislation and, and, and the, the policy set down. Kind of uh, the, the minister may have certain views and intentions. I suppose the board interprets the legislation or the the policy that it sees and is it produced. So we we often may not kind of be um, able to. To, to, to read the mind of what the minister may, we actually kind of look at the legislation, we look at the case law, we look at the, the guidance is there, and then we interpret it, and, and we expect to, that kind of, um, that reflects a consistency of approach, not only at the board level, but through local authorities, but maybe um, on a practical kind of case by case, or, or looking at how it applies in, in, uh, in, in reality, Rachel might be able to just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, um, obviously, we had the rural housing guidelines and they operated and introduced a certain level of consistency across the planning authorities and were understood then by the board. Uh, with the national planning framework, and actually before the national planning framework, there was obviously the European decision in relation to the social need. So the board have looked at that and obviously the national planning context now because again the rural housing guidelines are, are slightly out of date and again development plans, local area plans are also similarly out of date. Um, not fully reflecting the MPF and obviously then their regional strategies as well. So um, the same as we would in any other instance, we look at the, the national picture and go all the way down to the local context and where there's a, an inconsistency between the two, um, we, we look at the proper plan and sustainable development, predominantly starting at the, the most relevant, most recent and the national picture downwards. In relation to rural housing generally and the, the national um, at policy objective 19. I suppose, again, its interpretation depends on, on the particular case, but we would, I suppose, generally look at that policy and the MPF in terms of, um, in relation to rural areas, the idea of protecting the rural life, rural landscape, rural communities, and including the smaller rural villages also, and obviously planning authorities want to see um, populations directed there, but also facilitated in a lot of the rural areas as well. And again, where there are weaker um, rural areas with declining populations and so on, obviously the national planning policy facilitates housing in there, whether based on social, economic or other needs or local needs. But in relation to areas that are under strong urban influence, they are becoming under greater, stronger urban influence as urban areas densify and increase and the um, distances that people commute also increase. So some planning authorities are also, I suppose, taking an opportunity to reflect that in their decision making because the MPF 
has referenced that also. So again, um, some of the planning authorities are refusing on that basis, as are we. But we are aware and we are in consultation with the department who are currently reviewing are looking to review the rural housing guidelines, which will allow um, clarity and, I suppose, consistency in terms of the interpretation of the new national um, planning framework. The national planning framework was, in was intended to set a national picture, a national policy context, and was supposed to filter down. And that will happen. It just, there's a, obviously, as always, a, a time lag. But we are working to ensure that there are consistencies both within the board and, again, across planning authorities. And there is a, a shared understanding. And these, this can take a little bit of time to do that, but we've set up um, working groups and workshops to ensure that there is a consistent uh, approach or understanding in terms of the interpretation. And that's workshops with planning authorities, is it? No, initially internally, but we are in consul. Yeah. But the department have um, a steering group, and I think the CCMA through their Lutz committee as well are involved in looking at rural housing policy and rural housing for the development plans and local area plans, and we would be informed of those and ultimately. Um, involved in that and again when the department do review their rural housing guidelines um, I think it was what section 3.24 whatever which is the, the local need issue there will be public consultation in relation to that um, as well. Thank you. Aidan? Yeah just, just two brief uh, queries um, one I suppose is, is in relation to uh, which, you, which you're looking at, at uh, face on and dealing with I suppose objectors uh, to particular um, planning files. Um, as you know, we had a couple of high-profile ones uh, recently, which um, you know have been a loss to the state, like loss of serious investment to the state. Um, but I'm just curious: should, uh, just given your experience, uh, should there be some, um, you know, sort of guidelines or, or a <coughs> particular, um, you know, particular set of rules that somebody would wants to object to a planning file? Uh, that they should fit a certain criteria. Um, you know, if you go to look for planning, you have to fit a certain criteria to get the planning and whatever else. It's there, uh, you know, by the best of times, there's lots of hoops that jump through as we're after listening from Anthony here in relation to local plannings and everything else. But I'm just curious, anyone can rock up and object from wherever they want in their sitting room, wherever, like, you know, so uh, I, I'm just Really, uh, I, I'm trying to drill down, and, and if you think that uh, now is the time uh, that we should address this, that if somebody has a case to object, no problem. Um, you know, somebody wants to make an observation, brilliant. Anybody can make any observation, and the board can take that on board. Somebody to make serious objection um, it goes to you know a lot of these guys often might have different reasons for it, as, as we're aware, like, you know, but anything but uh, a good reason probably behind behind quite a lot of them. Um, I, I'm just curious if you think that they should fit some guideline or some criteria to make an objection. Uh, that's the first, uh, I, I'd like a straight answer on that, if at all possible, David. Um, and secondly, um, just in relation to which you had, you had hit on, Tony has picked up on a good bit of it here. Um, I suppose this emanates originally from the Flemish decision uh, in relation to one-off housing and, uh, as we called it at the time, local needs and whatever else. But I feel we got a, an Irish answer to uh, very much a, a problem we were hiding behind in Ireland here. It's local now and economic is, is the Irish answer to it. Has that been tested? Are we... Um, is that really suiting ourselves or dressing up the same thing again in whatever way we feel best? Ha has that been addressed in, in Europe or anywhere else to see that we are, uh, you know, fitting into European law as great Europeans and we can do what we want with no borders and all the rest of it? Or are we, uh, have we given ourselves an Irish um, answer to, to, to uh, uh, you know, what we have manipulated as an Irish problem? And secondly, under that, that particular part, uh, and, and you hit on it there, Rachel, and it was good to hear, just under the rural housing guidelines. Um, you know, and there are guidelines out there. Uh, my problem with planners, uh, or the only problem I, I ever see with planners, some of them are great and some of them are, are not so good from my own point of view, uh, and it's all down to interpretation. Uh, like, there is a massive variance in how planners interpret uh, the law um, or the guidelines. And I'm curious, are we... When new guidelines are released, um, are they brought in and said, well, look, is, this is done for this particular reason. This is why we feel X, Y, and Z. Uh, this is the reason why. Now, I know Tony, again, just briefly touched on this in relation to 
training or whatever else. But I think that's because if you just bring out guidelines and you throw it, throw it there, these are the guidelines, that's what we feel. The interpretation from where some of these people have come from, how they've been dealing with planning before, their backgrounds, everything lends into how they're going to interpret uh, the guidelines. And the variance in how you could get two different planners on a file and the variance in, in um, you know, the, the, the end result you get from those two different planners is chalk and cheese. Uh, and I have seen that firsthand. I could name you 20 cases if, if you know, that, and that's just not, um, I, I could say I could name more, I'd say, in my time in political life, depending on the planner you get. So, uh, I, I don't know if there's enough, if that's, if that's good enough, if that's good enough for the people of Ireland. I know this isn't your particular, exact particular remit, but you feed into a lot of it. But I just don't know if that's good enough for, for the people of Ireland that, God, if you've got planner A, you're going to, God, we'll have a good chance here. Yeah, she's tuned in, she knows it, she knows the locality, she knows blah, blah, blah. They're trying to keep people in the locality, whatever else. Or you got Planner B, God, he came from Dublin. No, no, that's going to be an old one-off planning or whatever. Or whatever, whatever. That, that happens. That's, that's unfortunately in rural Ireland real life. Um, so I'm just curious of your answer on, on both those queries. Thanks so much, Senator. And I might actually just even take that, kind of that, that, that last point first. And I suppose from the board's perspective, we have to ensure that we're consistent internally. So again, as, as Rachel has said, we have workshops where all of our planning team come around, we discuss issues, cases that have come through, emerging decisions, feedback from the board. So at least from our perspective, we're satisfied that all of our planners, I suppose, understand the context and understand the, the kind of uh, how, how we see the, the interpretation, as you say, of the guidelines and legislation. I think there is, as I said, it's my closing remarks uh, and my opening statement, I think there is a, there's an opportunity and, a, and, a, and a, a scope for the board to support and to engage with not only the department but with other local authorities and to ensure that through, through formal structures with the CCMA but also through engaging with and, and arranging for workshops and, and, and speaking kind of at events and that I think we can actually deliver and, and, and get the balance right. I think you're right. Uh, planning may be more than many other kind of uh, professions people have or bring certain kind of perspectives but that's not to say that one plan is correct and one, one isn't and I, there's always different considerations and maybe that also reflects the the point that the Senator Lawler kind of had raised around you know where the inspector kind of has a particular view and, and actually having that test then through the board itself and saying well actually there's there is a kind of a, a review of it. I, I obviously can't kind of speak kind of in relation to individual kind of local authorities and that but I know that from a uh, professional development perspective and indeed from a kind of elaborating and explaining what are new policies and, and, and new expectations. The department as well as the CCMA do arrange for kind of sessions where, where a lot of planners do get together and I think that sharing of information will help to maybe iron out some of those what you might see as divergences in, in, in approach in that. So I think it's something that we will always be working on and I think policy is changing quicker than you know kind of a uh, we can sometimes adapt to, and it's important that we retain that, that professional development piece. Um, on the, the, the question of the, the, the Flemish decree and, and whether the Commission, you know, whether it's, it's an appropriate kind of a, a approach or not, certainly, obviously, we've been engaging, or as in Ireland has been engaging with the Committee and Commission since 2007, 2008 in it. Obviously, the decision that came out um, was not just a decision in relation to an Irish, but it was something that we had to adapt to. Um, and I know from ongoing discussions that the department has had with the commission in relation to the NPF and some of the policies, um, certainly they're, they're satisfied that the policies set down in relation to, to rural kind of um, uh, housing and, and local need within the NPF are consistent with the Flemish decision. But maybe on that front, it's something probably that the, the department needs to, to provide its view on, on that kind of um, in the context. And, Maybe you feel that I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not giving you a straight answer on the very first question you had, but I suppose the board um, will look at every submission and every objection that comes through on the merits of the, app, of the application itself. We obviously have to make sure that it is a bona fides submission or objection and that it's not anonymous and that we have to be able to trace it and saying this is somebody who actually has outlined what their view is uh, and whether they make substantive um, issues and raise matters of planning kind of considerations 
or whether they're just kind of providing general support or, or, or objection, you know, these are all factors that the inspector and indeed ultimately the board will take on, will take on board. The, the system we have, as we outlined earlier on, it does allow for third party appeals. There are currently kind of um, not that many restrictions on being able to say, have I got a standing to make a case in that? Obviously, there are some EU kind of, kind of environmental requirements that allow people to actually kind of, um, in the interests of public good and in terms of public participation and the Aarhus kind of a convention, to enable them to actually make views known. So it isn't, I think, appropriate that you could restrict it to people within a certain zone. Um, but certainly, um, I think it is something that the Department and, and, and the Minister are, are looking at in the context of some historical cases that, I suppose, have shown up what might be seen as a kind of um, matters where the system mightn't be kind of, I suppose, fully aligned with what, what is kind of, it was intended to. So I think that's a matter for, for the Minister and the Department to look at, but I know it's, it's something that is, is, is certainly under consideration. And do you think would it help your, uh, would it help your job going forward to try and be constructive as a nation if we had some sort of guidelines for, I'm not saying, look, it has to be somebody within 20 miles or whatever, I'm not, I'm not tightening a, a, a noose around your neck here in relation mm. to it, Dave, but um, would you think it would be helpful, like, you know, to, to, that there would be some sort of, you know, some sort of a set of rules if somebody wanted to make, particularly an objection, uh, that they would fall under some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, schedule that, that, that they would fit into? To be honest, you can have, we look at the planning considerations that come through. So if somebody has a valid issue that they raise and, and, and it, it merits consideration and reflection by the inspector and the board, we will look at it. If someone comes in with... Do you look behind to see, well, what's the reason this guy is making it? No, I suppose it's the honest no. answer. No, no. That's why I'm asking the question. Maybe that should be done beforehand. Um, so you're still making a decision on the information you're getting or the objection you're getting, but why take every headbanger or whatever else take their, they, make a, they make a valid thing, but they're, they're not progressing our country. They're holding it back maybe in relation to develop that's needed in some area. And I suppose, well, this is ultimately what the board is, is tasked to do. It's actually to, to weigh up the different views and to decide what is in the national interest and what is the kind of uh, the decision. So, and again, kind of, uh, I think that is something that the board has been dealing with for, for 40 plus years. That's the system we have. And if there are changes that are being made and, and, and will, may well come through kind of this committee and then the Oireachtas in due course in terms of changes to legislation, we're happy to adapt to it. But I suppose until that is the case, we will continue to operate and, and deal fairly and, and in a balanced way with whatever submissions receive, whether they are, as you say, kind of um, valid or, or kind of, um, or maybe have ulterior motives. Headbanger, yeah, whatever. I mean, yeah, yeah. No I think it, it, we, can, we all have our views in relation to some third party appeals and the purpose of why they're appealing can be questioned, but at, 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 at times there's no doubt about it. And even I know some people are looking for financial reward out of that, if nothing else. But it has stymied a lot of critical development in the country over the years and it is a, something that we probably do need to look at. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank you today for your engagement. I think I could spend another two or three hours with you here going through the planning process. It has been very informative. A lot of issues have been raised about the one-off rural housing which is close to my own, my own heart and I am aware that there is huge inconsistencies in relation to one-off rural housing and a lot of that is down to not understanding the process. And that's why I think it's vital moving forward that everything is as transparent as, poli as possible and that all, we make it aware to the public that all this information is available to it online because constituents that come in to me and when I open up the computer and bring them all the way down into people who are objecting and everything is there, can I see this? They're shocked that they can actually, this information is actually available and I think it just puts the planning process in a better place. Um, and again, just to find us, we should look, David, in, in your job in hand. Uh, it's a tough job, uh, but uh, we'll be here for supporting you now, whatever way we can, and look forward to another engagement with you maybe in, in the near future to see how you're progressing on that 40%. Thank you very much. Now, I propose now we go into private session to deal with some housekeeping matters. We, we are in private session.